Thank you very much. And may I say that when we go into um, the open debate with audience members, I would ask you to uh, give us your affiliation and, and name and affiliation so we can recognize the spin, if any. <laughs> um, and let me start, indeed, uh, Robert, since you were already introduced, I, I was going to say much the same. But given the speed at which things have changed, how, how, how big a challenge is it to fashion policy and regulation, given that we cannot, or, or do you attempt to anticipate future developments and of what kind so that the regulations will not be always just out of date? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. Many thanks to IIEA uh, for the invitation and for McCann Fitzgerald for sponsoring this. Uh, on my mom's side, I have Shay and Sullivan. I'm wearing proudly my Irish harp today, so uh, it's good to be home. Uh, so Gorev Magrat to everybody. Um, and um, that's about a half of all my Irish right there. So, uh, But uh, excellent question, uh, and it is very difficult. And one of the things uh, I'm trying to do and have been trying to do in the U.S. is to talk about how to modernize um, the regulatory landscape and that would have to be done in our country through legislation. So as we were discussing uh, over lunch, uh, our laws are based on the Communications Act of 1934. Uh, I think uh, people of all political stripes can agree that a lot has happened since 1934. It was just outlined how much had happened since 2006 uh, when the number one social networking site was MySpace. Does anybody remember that one? Uh, so hopefully we can look at all of this through the lens of consumers and whether or not there's consumer harm. Um, it is evolving very rapidly. That brings with it a lot of promise and hope, but also brings with it a lot of threats as well, and perhaps we can drill down on some of those. And what are the threats in your view? Well, uh, certainly privacy is one of them, privacy on this side of the Atlantic. Uh, and um, uh, we have already seen uh, great controversy regarding, uh, of course, the NSA uh, scandal. Um, and what governments are doing, not just in the U.S., but as we're finding out almost every minute uh, through that, uh, what other governments uh, are doing with uh, either the monitoring of citizens abroad or within their own borders. Um, but also so are companies. We've known that for a while. And so are lone wolves, uh, you know, just individuals able to hack into uh, uh, whatever a database or uh, whatever for whatever purpose. Um, and as it becomes easier for all of us to communicate through a variety of means, uh, and there's a permanent record of those communications somewhere, uh, it also becomes easier in a way for um, folks, uh, uh, whether the intentions are, are good or bad, uh, to be able to, to hack into those. So what's going to be the future of privacy? What are the generational expectations of privacy as a result? As I look at my kids, I have three children, uh, a son who's 14, a daughter who's uh, 12, Mary Shea, named for uh, my great-grandmother, who was the immigrant, Mary Agnes Sullivan, Mary John Francis Shea. Um, and then the bonus ba baby, uh, Cormac, who's six. Uh, Cormac Augustine, uh, whose name gets mutilated in the States, but over here, everyone would know how to pronounce uh, Cormac. But as I look at the, their uh, consumption habits and their expectations, um, uh, Jennifer, my wife, and I, we try to impose our views of uh, privacy and what's appropriate. Um, but as they grow up, uh, that that's going to become increasingly difficult uh, unless there's a, a huge uh, crisis, sort of a Pearl Harbor of privacy. And maybe we're starting to see that. Uh, we don't know yet. There might be. There might be, and there probably will be. Yeah. Um, so uh, whether that's you know one day a billion people's bank accounts have been cleaned out uh, or uh, uh, something that uh, shows how vulnerable uh, things are, the experts in cybersecurity in particular uh, do say there will be some sort of uh, uh, catastrophe that'll be on a large scale at some point. Now, uh, probably the large scale catastrophe won't be nation state sponsored, although it could be in, in that context of cleaning out bank accounts. Uh, but it could be in terms of power grids going down or uh, other sort of national uh, functions, uh, infrastructure, national defense, things of that nature. Uh, it's, it's, you know, those in the know say it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And gi given there's a lot of debate at the moment now about what's on the, what's available through these systems and the issues of censorship or issues of what's appropriate to be there, who should the sense, you know, let, let's say, I think there are going to be censors. Of course, who wants um, 
certain material available casually to children. Uh, so how can that be managed, or what are the challenges of managing that? And this is right at the crux of the future of uh, internet governance and treaties uh, and uh, things such as child pornography are easy, right? Those, that's kind of the, uh, the low-hanging fruit easy, in terms but of... They're not, not, but not a, lot ha not a lot necessarily happens. They're hard well, to when I say easy, yeah. it's easy, easy for folks to agree yeah. that that's a yeah. bad thing and yeah. should be kept yeah. off the net. Yeah. That's what I meant by easy. Yeah. Um, but there are then thornier issues, uh, copyright protection, right? So intellectual property. So, you know, the internet is a tool. It's a dynamic and revolutionary tool, but it is a tool nonetheless. So can it be used uh, for nefarious purposes, for law-breaking that by any other measurement would be law-breaking? Can you use it to steal things? Can you use it to sell heroin? Can you use it to purvey child pornography? Um, and said in that way, it seems easy, but then copyright protection is different uh, depending on different national laws. And so uh, uh, that becomes more cumbersome as we see just the, the engineering, uh, the architecture of the net being a global network of networks uh, without borders. Um, so you can, if you're transmitting something to your next door neighbor, actually that transmission might get bounced around several different countries on every continent except for maybe Antarctica uh, and then end up next door. So what does that mean in terms of legal jurisdiction? And as we go forward uh, as a world community, um, these will questions will have to be addressed, uh, but there'll always be the tension between what do we do as a world community, and what do we do about national sovereignty, and what do we do about sovereignty of the individual as well. Now, the United Nations wants to play a role in that, but you, you're very skeptical about their, their particular role that they want to play and the manner in, and who's influencing their particular voting pattern on this issue. So, exactly. Um, so, internet governance, uh, since the privatization of the internet. So since the days of DARPAnet, uh, tax, US taxpayer funded uh, network, um, and that's uh, then uh, IP, uh, TCP IP uh, you know, protocol was uh, invented to, f to run it. And then in the mid 90s, we saw the internet migrate further away from government control and become privatized and open up for public use. And at that point, internet governance became uh, what we call multi-stakeholder, it was non-governmental. You had engineers and academics and user groups and others working in their individual capacities, not on behalf of governments, uh, to keep these networks robust and up and running and how do you keep them uh, safe from denial of service attacks and things of that nature. Um, and that has worked quite well. So you've seen this as the fastest growing disruptive technology in human history, uh, perhaps since the invention of fire, I think, uh, or discovery of fire, uh, I think it has uh, probably done more to improve net-net, the human condition, than any other technology. Um, but like fire, it certainly has dangers. Uh, fire can be used for good things, to cook your food, sterilize things, but can also burn down your house. Um, the internet, if misused, can, can do the same thing. Um, and so, you know, grappling with all that is what's important. But I think we need to preserve the multi-stakeholder model for internet governance. I do not think that in a, the NSA issue uh, should um, cloud that. So what we see with, with NSA um, is we're also you know, discovering that uh, other nations are doing the same thing uh, and um, the story will continue to evolve. We'll learn a lot more about it. But the idea of government involvement in this space, I don't think that is cured by having more government involvement in this space. Um, and so the question becomes then how do you resolve it? How do you resolve the monitoring? Um, but I don't think another uh, overlay, an intergovernmental or international overlay into the internet governance space is the answer. I'm not sure what the answer is, but I don't think you solve government intrusion by having more government intrusion. Um, I think that ultimately will harm the developing world. I think when you look at uh, the World Conference on International Telecommunications, the treaty uh, negotiation this past uh, December in Dubai, um, uh, for 10 years or more, we've seen Russia and China and a lot of their client states uh, pushing for more international control of uh, the internet. In fact, Vladimir Putin said uh, just a couple of years ago, very explicitly and openly, he wanted, inter quote, international control of the internet under the auspices of the ITU. And that's almost an exact quote. So what does that mean? Well, I think the selling point for uh, uh, a lot of countries is that uh, the internet, uh, and it's a, a bit of a mistake to put the, the article V in front of it, but um, 
uh, as being dominated by the U.S. Uh, in a number of uh, factions. They see uh, companies uh, such as Google or Facebook you see, or Twitter. You see uh, Internet backbone, such as the old MCI backbone owned, owned by Verizon and, and also AT&T. Um, you see a lot of money being made. You see ICANN, uh, which uh, administers uh, names and numbers, having been an arm of the Department of Commerce, but over year, the years has been, uh, become um, has migrated you know, further away from government control, but nonetheless is perceived by some or alleged by some uh, to still be an arm of the U.S. government, even though the facts might say otherwise, and even though it, it might have its own issues. Um, so all of that is seen as... But a lot of its interests might coincide with those of the U.S. government and, uh, and to say of your own outlook as an American Republican who believes in less government, basically, don't you? Right. So perhaps the cure for that isn't to have a, you know, a different governmental control. Uh, it is to have less governmental control of anybody's government, to have it more, uh, more bottom-up in that regard. Um, and the architecture of the Internet really defies centralized control anyway. There's always going to be a workaround, as we saw with in Egypt when there was an attempt to turn off the internet kill switch, uh, you saw within 24, 48 hours workarounds uh, to that, uh, to where the government then couldn't control it. Um, and so in the short term I might be pessimistic, in the long term I'm more optimistic in terms of being able to control the flow of information. And keep in mind that the flow of information is a threat to authoritarian top-down regimes. Um, and that is the real motivation here. Um, it's and, and all the rest of this is just sort of sales pitches. You know, a, a pre you know, these are pretexts for, um, for ensuring that authoritarian regimes can have more control. And it legitimizes uh, walled gardens and intranets like you see in China or Iran. Some, you know, these are uh, two of the most uh, vociferous uh, proponents of uh, international uh, regulation of, of Internet governance. So you see the, the UN intervention in any of this as sort of enemies of promise, of, of, of you know, undermining that which might bring better, uh, better forms of politics and representation of peoples in various countries, particularly authoritarian countries. Again, exactly. The, the concern being the, the answer to having government intervention is not more government intervention. Um, we can return to some of these issues, but I want to both throw, I'm not saying that I'm not going to ask further questions, but I am going to now invite the the audience to come in on this, because I know there are, there are huge, the agenda that you've covered and your own experience is extraordinarily wide um, and multifaceted. And I know there are many different interests in the room, and that's why um, I want people just to say who they are and if they want to give us a quick comment of where they're coming from, as it were. Can I? Yes. I don't think you need one. I think the room is, the room is good enough. Back, yeah. I believe. Oh, we back, have a mic as well, mic. yeah. Okay. It's so if you wait eventually. for them, if you wait for the mic, because the camera would appreciate it too. We can. Uh, John will sing a few songs before yeah. the. Yeah. While we're waiting for the mic, there we go. Fine. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is William Fagan. I'm at the Institute, and for five years I was our country editor in the state of Qatar, which is about 200 miles from Iran, and the home of Al Jazeera. So. I could tell by your accent you're from Qatar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's actually pronounced, they pronounce it Qatar, which is the same as Qatar, but the Irish word for, for, for town. So yeah. it's just, as, if you put a soft T, it's definitely not Qatar, which I'm sorry, a lot of Americans. <laughs> uh, sorry about that, but to get on to that. Um, one of the things I found when I went out there is I was very familiar with the European framework. And uh, it was a, a relief in some ways because we're still in the. One of the we just have to complete the WTO requirement, which was to separate telecoms regulation from ownership. And, and in Qatar, the government still owns the telecoms. Still has 50% investment in what is now Urdu, the former QTAR. So I accepted that as a cultural thing, but the great thing was that we basically had a tabula rasa. Uh, we had people like Hank, Hank Infant from Canada. And over the years, we've had a lot of people from your part of the world, people like David Gross, um, Catherine Abernathy, uh, Dr. Bob Pepper. I'm sure you know all of these people. <laughs> Dr. Pepper, yes. Yes, yeah, Dr. Pepper, definitely. Yeah. Formerly one of your starboards at the FCC. But one of the things was that I didn't have to worry about things like concepts like state aids. I didn't have to worry about Article 7. I think Damien can enjoy this. I didn't have to worry ab about Beric. I didn't have to worry about any of that. We could create our own law. But we could also design it culturally for what we yeah. Do I hear a question coming? There is a question coming. Yeah. Yeah. 
And the, the this is the home of the gift of the gap, though, right? Is, because you find that one, one, of, one, of the, one of the perceptions, as it were, of Google and Microsoft is, is monoculture, US culture, Western culture. There are cultural differences around the world. And I, I'm not talking about China, I'm not talking about the US, I'm just talking about the Middle East. And the model which serves well in Europe and indeed the FCC in Washington is not the model which works everywhere in the world. And I just like your, your thoughts, your comments on that. Excellent lead in, by the way, and uh, uh, excellent point. And, and this was something that uh, during, especially the bilateral talks uh, in Dubai uh, last December, uh, I talked about very specifically um, with, with countries such as Saudi Arabia. Let's just pick that one as, as an example, which is uh, national sovereignty. So actually the multi-stakeholder non-governmental uh, posture or model uh, is actually better for national sovereignty. So certainly every nation state has a right uh, to administer things according to their culture. And what is not offensive in the US in terms of content might be offensive elsewhere. Um, and uh, uh, that's why I think it's important to not to, ha not to have a new international regulatory overlay. Because the question I have there is, uh, does that um, start to legitimize across the board the imposition of the, what I would view as, uh, I guess somewhat pejoratively, the lowest common denominator in terms of freedom of speech um, uh, on countries that now enjoy it. So instead of the Saudis of the world saying, uh, we don't like the content that comes from the US uh, over the internet, and so therefore we're gonna filter that out, um, does it become a matter of, well, going from the US to Ireland or Ireland to the US or whatever the case might be, uh, that someone in Geneva is going to have uh, authority over that. Um, so you start to create that, just that type of uncertainty. Uh, there's lots of uncertainty, economic uncertainty as well, which we could talk about more. But in terms of uh, content, political speech, uh, let's forget about some of the obvious choices of uh, you know, morality, um, uh, speech regarding morality. Um, so does this become a choke point uh, for freedom of speech? Um, and if, uh, Countries, I guess, want to have their own intranets, uh, so be it. In a way, as reluctant as I am to say that, that's their sovereign right. Uh, that's not how I want to see the US or what I, I would hope all countries ultimately would be liberal democracies, as class, classical liberal democracies. Um, but that would be the Saudi right or the Iranian right or whatever the case might be. Um, so, and I, th and I actually think that their arguments for more intergovernmental control actually undermine their, object their own objectives, whether they realize it or not. Yes. Uh, Donna told me that my name on this business communications at PR firm, and it's kind of follow on from, from that point. Um, the dark internet seems to be on the rise more and more at the consumer level, whether it's in the likes of the Middle East, because we don't like the, the government imposed restrictions, or here, um, just for, for, for the pure enjoyment of, of hiding who you are and, and, and what you're doing. Um, to go back to your earlier point about uh, an Armageddon moment, it seems we had one in the, in the financial system, uh, which was brought about a lot by the, the shadow markets in, in, in many ways. And I just wonder if there's some sort of an, an analogy between are the shadow markets operate in the financial system and the dark internet, say, and uh, hiding IP addresses in, in, in the internet, and uh, whether there is another way that isn't state-controlled um, that people are giving thought to and what, what the thought leadership in that direction is saying at the moment. So if I could just ask a clarifying question, which is, so, so you're saying the financial crisis, the mortgage crisis was somehow related to Markets no, created by the internet, or I'm confused. No, it was 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 based on the um, the development of a much more complex system than than simple banks doing simple transactions. It was based around context of differences. It was based around uh, the, the packaging up of subprime loans in the U.S. and selling them all around all around the world in ways that people couldn't trace where it was coming from. Um, and that would be one of the concerns, I imagine, in, in the, the world of the internet. If you have a country-based IP protocol, you know, you kind of know where everybody is. And now we're starting to get around that, either by terrorists or more simply by consumers, for various different reasons. 
And is that bad? Is that good? It's obviously open for, for debate. But if it's not country control, um, what other sorts of models are out there? Yeah, if I, so you raise a lot of potential issues, which uh, we could talk about the rest of the day, but we don't have time. But um, so I'll tell you what one of my concerns is. So it's, uh, the, uh, China actually proposed this as lead, you know, leading up to the wicket, and I imagine leading up to the uh, ITU's plenipotentiary uh, conference uh, next year in, that'll take place in Korea. Uh, it's essentially a constitutional convention for the ITU. They will elect a new um, leader, the leading candidate right now, new Secretary General, the leading candidate right now is Yulan Zhao of China. Um, so China has proposed uh, having a global registry of IP addresses to associate every IP address with a person. Um, yeah, I have a very strong opinion on that. I would be strongly opposed to that. That is probably more to track political uh, speech than anything else. And if you think about the number of IP addresses with IPv6 that there'll be out there with the Internet of Things, uh, that would be tracking uh, everything from refrigerators and automobiles uh, and, and more than just your you know, personal computer, right? So there, there are a lot of things that are going to have IP addresses in the coming years. So I think that's a very dangerous um, uh, proposal. Um, you know, again, back to the earlier premise, which is the Internet is a tool. Uh, and it, like any tool, like a crowbar, it can be used for illegal purposes. A crowbar is supposed to be designed for legal purposes of pulling out nails and prying things apart, but it can be used to break into someone's house as well. So let's look at what the, the act is that's wrong. So if it's securities fraud, to, if I understand your uh, example uh, properly, then that's, that's a violation. I think part of your question is, well, how do we know who committed the securities fraud? Um, and uh, sometimes that's, you know, in, in history, that's uh, always been an issue pre-internet as well. So let's focus on on the laws being broken rather than breaking the internet to ensure things uh, like that don't happen. Yeah. Uh, Eamon Ryan. Eamon Ryan from the Green Party working at the Institute. You mentioned there that you saw the potential for less government control, more bottom up, if I got the bird right, consumer focused regulatory system. Can you go into more details as to how you think that might be structured or uh, have you a vision for how that might actually be a reality, where that where might go with that? Yes, excellent question. By the way, I'm enjoying this uh, Tipperary water, which, uh, so my grandfather, just a footnote real quickly, fought in World War I. So I was the only kid in my class who had a grandfather that old. Um, <laughs> fought in World War I. And fought in, a, in France alongside some Irish troops. And uh, he came back and, and would sing, It's a Long Way to Tipperary. Uh, so that's what I think of when I'm drinking Tipperary water. Not to, it was not a product plug. Uh, sorry about that. But anyway. <laughs> um, I think it can emulate, you know, I think regulation can emulate the architecture of the Internet itself. And this sounds a bit idealistic, and that's because it is. But um, in that, I don't think there's another technology that has empowered the sovereignty of the individual like the Internet. Uh, I think if you look at how it is helping commerce, so whether it's uh, uh, consumer-generated uh, sites, if you want to rate your hotel or the restaurant or the plumber uh, in your neighborhood, you can do that. And that makes information very cheap and quick, and there's crowd, essentially crowdsourcing. Uh, in the old days, we called crowdsourcing democracy. Uh, so, you know, um, the things that are wiki, you know, where, uh, well, the Athenians with their democracies, uh, you know, figured that out a long time ago. But, so those, those can apply there. So you, I think when you diffuse power and you put it into the hands of individuals, um, that can be very, well, empowering, for lack of a better word. Uh, so I think regulations could start from that perspective. But let's focus on what empowers consumers, uh, what limits consumer harm as best as possible. There are always going to be fraudsters and bad actors in any economy, in, in any government, in any you know throughout the world. Um, but I, you know, I think this is a terrific time to be a consumer. I also think we are just now entering the golden age of uh, mobile. And when you combine, uh, combine the, the power of the internet with the power of uh, mobility, uh, I think that uh, uh, can also be a model for, uh, for governance and regulations going forward. So um, you do have to have enforcement, and that you know, state, uh, uh, state power for enforcement of laws is always, uh, always important. Enforcement of contract uh, to you know, prevent fraud or certainly prosecute it should it happen. Uh, criminal activity as well. Um, but let's maybe uh, look at our governments through the structure of the internet rather than looking at old governmental structure and centralized power and foisting that 
on the net, which defies that type of architecture. Yes, third row there. Thank you, John. Uh, Philip O'Brien, a member of the Institute, but I have an interest in international trade. Um, right at the very beginning, you talked about um, the preserving the multi stakeholder model. And I'm curious to understand maybe a little bit more about your apparent opposition to UN standards. Um, for example, when you were, when John and you were exchanging on that, um, you mentioned something about um, the voting that can go on at the table at the UN. So was there some reference there to maybe uh, commercial voting? Uh, I'm trying to understand your question, which was trying to understand my statement. So uh, a little bit of a hallway of mirrors here. Yeah. Uh, but um, so uh, the first of all, the ITU, which is a UN chartered agency, right, an arm of the UN. Uh, and by the way, I, you, let me drop an important footnote here, which is I'm not anti-ITU. Uh, the ITU performs many uh, very important functions. It's a forum uh, for the negotiation of treaties, uh, whether it's a spectrum harmonization, satellite orbital slots, all those are extremely important. Um, I just don't think it's the best uh, way to address internet governance. So I, I think, you know, if, if we look at if the efficiency of uh, some UN agencies uh, uh, and, you know, various uh, despots who've been in charge of the Human Rights uh, Commission and uh, things of that nature, uh, it starts to undermine uh, certainly the efficiency of it, if not the credibility of it. I'm not anti-UN. I think the U.S. should uh, be part of the UN. But again, for the Internet itself, um, either nothing happens at the UN or uh, something that will be centralized uh, and more authoritar authoritarian in nature will happen there. And, and, and neither of those is good. I think that will impede uh, technological progress. And ultimately, I think it will harm the developing world the most. The developing world stands to gain the most from an unfettered internet, especially a mobile internet. Um, and I've written uh, and spoken before uh, about this, and you know, there's one quick example of that, which uh, if you'll just indulge me for 30 seconds, which, um, and this can be multiplied many billions of times over probably, but uh, it looked at um, a story of two pineapple farmers in Ghana. And for generations, these uh, families uh, were barely above being subsistence farmers, barely made enough to just feed and clothe their families, uh, and they raised uh, pineapples. Part of that was because they were selling their pineapples below market rates because they didn't have the information regarding market rates. As soon as they got something that was a, a mobile device, uh, not even up to the level of a smartphone, but allowed them to access uh, information, um, there was uh, apparently a platform where they could figure out regional and national prices for pineapples. They were able to raise their prices uh, and greatly increase their standards of living and actually buy property and buy more property and employ people. Uh, this not only, you know, the, the ownership of property not just revolutionized them for the first time, probably in the entire lineage of their ancestry, um, but also started to raise political expectations. And it, this is where then authoritarian regimes become very concerned. As individuals own property and become more empowered, uh, they might expect more from the political process. Um, and uh, so some folks in charge of some countries might not like that very much. So replicate that many, many times over. And uh, uh, I think it's only a net net positive for the human condition uh, as a whole if we allow uh, that type of progress to continue. Mm. And generally speaking, what, what do you see as the can you see then? Well, uh, the answer to this is probably has to be no, or you wouldn't be here. You'd be somewhere in uh, marketing the device or looking for capital to develop it. But imaginatively, can you see what style, what type of empowerment will come next in this whole field, and what will the regulatory challenge be? Do you have any kind of broad notions in that field? Yeah, I think it, the technology already exists in prototype format. Um, so. Uh, I think we're just now in the infancy of uh, especially mobile communications. So I don't know if anyone here in the room, if it came to Ireland like it did in the US, but probably 35, 40 years ago, the game Pong, the video game, very simple video game, 
Okay, so we're in the Pong uh, stage, I think, of internet connectivity and, and the mobile internet. Uh, and we will look back at these days and uh, just say how cute uh, everything was. Um, so, uh, it, it sounds like science fiction, but actually it all, it all actually exists. So, high definition holograms. Um, if you choose surgically implanted communications devices, uh, I maybe won't choose to do that, but uh, some <laughs> will. Uh, literally video projected to the inside of your eyeball. Uh, and uh, I don't know what happens if that goes awry, uh, but uh, so um, that could all have tremendous uh, benefits. Uh, we already see medical devices, and, and this was a small thing we did at the commission as a matter of process, but revolutionary. If you're a victim of paralysis, uh, it had been held up um, in government, mainly by our Federal Aviation Administration, um, the idea of these uh, devices that are surgically implanted into the limbs of uh, victims of paralysis um, to, ha to essentially replicate the nervous system. And they'd be associated with electrodes uh, to where there would be electrical charge that would uh, move muscles. So it allows, this is actually some experimentation in, outside of London, it allows the victims of paralysis to walk again. All right, absolutely revolutionary. Um, uh, but through wireless connectivity. Um, if there was a severed spine or whatever the case might be or a severed nerve somewhere, um, the, the, you know, through wireless technology we could route around that. Um, the FAA was concerned that one milliwatt of power might crash an airplane, but we got them over that concept and so now, now it's available. Um, so the, it's really unimaginable, um, but also uh, imagination is, is, is boundless at the same time uh, in terms of what might happen. This though, from a regulatory perspective, uh, I think we'll, we will uh, face a lot of uh, challenges regarding spectrum availability. Uh, so uh, right now we think the best spectrum is under one gigahertz, uh, not to, to get too much in the weeds. Actually, I think that concept will be tossed aside before long. We already see in our country the build out of LTE or 4G uh, uh, infrastructure above two gigahertz. Granted, you need to have your antennas closer together, so it requires more capital expenditures, but someday I think we can get over that. There's even experimentation above five gigahertz in that area. Um, so, uh, but bringing more spectrum to market, um, and as a regulator, the, are there any, and they were in Ireland, I don't know if the original Star Trek was ever watched here, right? So any, any Trekkies in the audience? I'll admit it, if you will, okay? <laughs> so, the, the prime directive uh, in Star Trek was? Don't interfere. Don't interfere, very good. <laughs> Which, of course, they violated, they violated in every episode, right? Or else they wouldn't have had a TV show, right? So in wireless policy, it's have no harmful interference, right? Um, I think technology will advance to the point where we won't have to worry as much about harmful interference because that's really at the root of all spectrum policy. There's competitions issues too, but uh, when you're licensing and the table of allotments, where are mobile carriers gonna be versus broadcasters, you have, it's like real estate. You, you can't have noisy neighbors next to one another, so you need to put them in different neighborhoods so they can party away and have their noisy uh, parties uh, without harmful interference, right? Mm -hmm. So it's this, this is how I think. I was a liberal arts major, so you know, I'm not, a, not an engineer. This is how I, uh, the analogies I use. So there'll be a lot of challenges there, and then government uses this. So in our country, the federal government occupies about 80% of the best spectrum. Does it need all of that uh, all the time? And uh, my hypothesis is no. I would love to see the U.S. Congress uh, uh, pass legislation and the president sign it uh, that says uh, the federal government has to do a bona fide, honest audit of all the spectrum it's using uh, and then try to um, relinquish it for auction. Maybe some un unlicensed purposes too. Unlicensed is very important. Um, but to get it out of the hands of the government and into the hands of the economy, which has this tremendous effect in terms of growing the economy, improving the human condition, increasing tax revenue back to the government as a result of all that economic activity. So it's a virtuous cycle. And in your, Europe is way behind American on 4G. Um, can, can, it catch, can it catch up, close the gap? It can, absolutely. Um, so, um, you know, for the most part, uh, the American wireless sector has been relatively lightly regulated. Um, we were sort of first to market, or at least first to market in a big way in the 700 megahertz auction. Um, uh, I, I was there at the commission for that. Um, and also the AWS uh, one auction, uh, it that was August of 06. Uh, the uh, 
700 megahertz auction started late in uh, December of 07, went into early 08. Um, and that's what really sparked our build out of uh, 4G. And uh, there are a lot of carriers that want to uh, accelerate that. And then at some point we'll be talking about 5G, you know. So um, I think that was a, a large part behind uh, Verizon's uh, intent to buy out Vodafone uh, so that they could plow the money they were sending to Vodafone back into network upgrades. So. Um, uh, but I do think Europe, uh, you know, it depends on the regulatory climate, um, and uh, the conventional wisdom says that Europe is more regulatory on the wireless front uh, than is the U.S., and it might have something to do with it. But that's for historical reasons, because of course when it all began, e Europe was, well, much tighter space. I mean, yes. America had geography on its side, if you like, and uh, when, spectra when wavelengths for radio broadcasting were, were scarce, Europe was very, very uh, competitive with interference, so with Copenhagen agreements and so on. So that's, I think the, a lot of that history is still kind of embedded in the... And the state-owned PTTs yeah, and yeah, all the rest, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So what do you say then to um, the argument about uh, the, a regulator for Europe? Should, we, uh, should, it, should the EU be attempting a pan-European single regulator, or do you think that's just so difficult when you have so many countries involved? Why do I have the feeling you want me to wade into a political swamp right now? <laughs> um, so when I was at the FCC, I was always careful uh, when I traveled abroad to say, uh, please learn from the mistakes as well as the successes of, of the US, and I'm never going to tell another country or group of countries how to do it. Uh, you have to determine what's best for themselves. But now that I'm not a regulator, what do I do? I guess I, I can't uh, just uh, cling to that. So. Um, you, I, I think simple is always better, simple and light touch. So wireless lends itself well to competition. Um, is, and especially even if you see concentration of, uh, let's say, four carriers to three, and maybe two dominant out of those three like we have in our country, uh, the, one of the big escape valves for that is, is unlicensed. Um, you know, I know someone who, who got uh, her master's in London a couple of years ago and never subscribed to a wireless carrier and through, the, you know, unlike through Wi-Fi uh, in coffee shops or on campus was able to do uh, all of her communication, you know, web, web uh, traffic as well as uh, Skyping back home without paying a carrier a dime. Uh, so that is competition to the carrier, right? Um, and actually those people aren't really captured uh, in a lot of uh, statistics, uh, whether it's the OACD survey or whatever, which focuses on subscribers. Well, there are millions, if not billions, of people who aren't subscribers who are still <laughs> using uh, some sort of broadband uh, facility, wireless, in an unlicensed way. Um, so I think simple is better, uh, and a lighter touch is better. And let's look at a lot of this through competition law and consumer protection law, uh, rather than traditional telecoms regulation that's uh, sort of still has the, the mindset of being uh, in the fixed circuit switched analog voice world. Uh, that is really a thing of the past, where you have open, dedicated circuits that are locked open and uh, voice you know, traveling back and forth. Uh, uh, through IP and, and wireless, there's tremendous opportunities here, and I think it's only terrific for consumers if we don't mess it up as governments. Mm. Eamon, do you want to come in on some of this, I think? No, I'm listening. You're listening, okay. Yes, here. Oh, my cousin, <laughs> Katie Sullivan. All right, Faith and We're a cable operator here in, in Ireland, and we're a member of the Liberty Global um, Cable Network, um, which is the largest cable operator uh, outside the US. Um, the question I'm going to ask, and maybe it might sound a little bit strange coming from a cable operator, but whose business is very much focused on serving the highest and big data networks Europe and the United markets and industry at present, because they will clearly believe in high-speed broadband and high-speed data services and the like. Um, a lot of the debate in Europe and certainly in Ireland at the moment is very much based around consumer regulation and facilitating competition, the rollout of high-speed data networks. And therefore, the debate is very much focused on uh, the supply side, the supply side of high-speed data networks. Um, and from a policy standpoint, I understand that you you are in the regulator in the states. But I'm <coughs> any observations you might have on that market there, or indeed um, in conversations you might have had with your international colleagues on any demand stimulation measures. You kind of alluded to them a little bit earlier on in terms of 
US government potentially through Spectrum and so forth. But I think sometimes the debate is missed in Europe a little bit that the networks will be built in certain parts and other parts will not be built. But we're kind of missing a trick, I think, a little bit in terms of what can governments or what can policymakers or indeed maybe regulators do to stimulate demand, the demand side in education. I'd be interested in your views on that. Excellent question. Uh, I must have said something she disagreed with because she disavowed that we were cousins right off the bat, <laughs> I noticed. But, um, so, uh, uh, this has been a topic of discussion and even debate in the U.S. for a few years. So, while 95% or so of the country has access to at least one broadband provider in, in the U.S., um, and with the vast majority having uh, access to two or more, excuse me, uh, the penetration rate, adoption rate is only about 70%. But again, that's um, subscribers. Okay, so we, I, I really, I'm begging whoever's listening to please try to do some surveys and, and, and it's gonna be hard to measure those who are broadband users but are not subscribers. But they're out there. They could be municipal Wi-Fi, campus Wi-Fi, you know, it could be a lot of things. Um, so it's a, it's a big debate. So um, right now, the chairman of the Senate Commerce Committee, uh, Jay Rockefeller, who has announced his retirement, so this, he's entering his last year in office, um, he was a, a champion in the 96 Act, uh, 1996 Act, for the Schools and Library Fund, which funded uh, the uh, build out or connection to public schools and libraries uh, to what we called the information superhighway back then in 98. Um, that's largely been accomplished. So now he is saying uh, we need to stimulate demand, uh, but we also need to take uh, the Schools and Libraries Fund to the, the next level, which is perhaps devices, uh, digital literacy, uh, and things of that nature. So the seeds for that have been planted. That will be, uh, I think, a bit of a controversial debate in our country uh, because it'll be seen as the uh, expansion of an entitlement, a federal entitlement. Now, wh what's interesting about how we, just as a footnote here, uh, administer it in our country is it doesn't, the subsidy does not come out of the Treasury. It's not coming out of the general taxation into the U.S. Treasury and then out. It goes from uh, telecoms uh, consumers into a fund that's ultimately administered by the FCC, and then uh, the checks are cut to um, uh, companies, to the operators, network operators. Um, lots of debate as to whether or not uh, it should be vouchers that go to consumers, and would that provide for a more competitive marketplace uh, and the build out of redundant facilities and things like that, rather than uh, just uh, reselling um, uh, one type of facility. Um, so, uh, I, I think it's an interesting issue. It could also be a generational issue. There are a lot of reasons to why people don't subscribe. Um, price has something to do with it, but the, a lot of the studies I've seen show that it's not price alone. Uh, sometimes when uh, uh, broadband has been offered for free, fixed broadband has been offered for free, some people still wouldn't take it. Um, and so that could be generational. Um, it could be a variety of reasons. Uh, digital literacy being one of them. Uh, you still have to have a device, too, so then the, the question becomes, do you subsidize the device, which uh, uh, Chairman Rockefeller has alluded to that. So it's an excellent question. I think over time it resolves itself uh, uh, much the same way that the telephone did. So in our country, you know, it didn't take that long to get to 98% teledensity, uh, and I think uh, Internet access will you know, follow a, a similar a similar trend, if it hasn't already, because we're not measuring non-subscribers. So I think the number's a lot higher than 70% in our country anyway, but not everywhere, so. Yeah. Yes, here first, and then. Yeah. Uh, thank you, John. My name is Mark Redmond, from the Irish Tax Institute, and good reason not to ask a tax question. And um, this has been a great presentation. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and experience. Can I just assume and be optimistic and say that a trade deal is reached between the states and the European Union. What would you like to see as the key benefits for the communication sector from such a deal? Well, I think, uh, first of all, certainty, I think, helps. Uh, I philosophically am a big believer in free trade. Uh, so low taxation, low barriers to entry, low tariffs, uh, if any. Um, and I hope those would be two uh, cornerstones to that. I understand there's a big uh, debate over uh, privacy, and it's the uh, uh, official position of the U.S. government to maintain that sort of self-monitoring model, but with a backstop of uh, government intervention uh, or enforcement, uh, if possible. Um, 
you know, in the wake of uh, all the NSA revolution, revelations, uh, that's going to become more sticky and difficult. I hope uh, we do pass it. I think it's absolutely necessary. I'm actually working uh, through the Hudson Institute with some other uh, think tanks, uh, with Annenberg and with um, Brookings and some others, on the idea of handling a lot of cross-border data flow issues through tr free trade agreements. Um, and if that's regionally, then so be it. Uh, but we can handle a lot of these sticky questions, maybe even regarding internet governance, uh, through those. Um, and it's, you know, we can call it cross-border data flow, but the analogy would be the cross-border flow of goods and services, too, and uh, sort of take our, our model from some of those. Um, so I'm a, I'm a big pro proponent of those types of agreements, um, and I hope they would uh, look at trade uh, with a light touch from a government perspective. Yes, here. Michael is just coming. Um, Eric Starr from the Irish Constitution Party. Um, I hope my friends can comment and misinterpret this question. But um, you made a reference to the preference for light regulation in the communication sector. And uh, it was that many of the issues to be dealt with by consumer protection and competition law. Um, do you think, therefore, that uh, a separate regulator like the FCC See, he's trying to get me to wade into the morass, too, <laughs> isn't he? So, uh, excellent question, by the way. And um, something I've actually addressed before, even when I was a commissioner. Um, so, uh, uh, th I think there are some aspects of what the... I'm just speaking about the American FCC now. I'm not going to tell Ireland what to do, okay? Uh, but um, I think there are some aspects of what the FCC does which could be wound down. Um, now, the FCC does many important things. So certainly our International Bureau uh, helps uh, with international treaties. Uh, there are certifications of equipment to ensure no harmful interference. There's the administration of our Universal Service Fund. Um, but when it comes to things like merger review, uh, the government gets two bites at the apple. There's uh, either the Federal Trade Commission or the Department of Justice Antitrust Division, depending on whether it's a common carrier or not. Um, Federal Trade Commission is our general consumer protection agency. Uh, it also primarily handles privacy. Uh, and I was delighted that they did as an FCC commissioner because that's such a sticky wicket. I don't, I'm not sure the FCC could handle it um, and get up to speed. You know, I'd rather have someone else do that. Um, so I, I think there's some aspects that could be, uh, could be wound down. Now, there are some, you know, if you read some academic articles and such, they say, just get rid of the FCC altogether, except for maybe enforcement, have it be the independent law enforcement authority. Um, the FTC is primarily an enforcement agency. It does not really have a rulemaking authority. Uh, that's something to think about. Uh, should you have spectrum uh, administration done through, let's say, the executive branch? So right now, you have an assistant secretary of commerce, Larry Strickling. I don't know if he's been to Ireland. I'll try to get him to come. Uh, great guy who's the assistant secretary for NTIA, our agency that handles government spectrum. Well, could the government handle all spectrum uh, in terms of uh, allocation for licenses? Uh, the, the executive branch, could the executive branch handle a government spectrum? Um, and the, the answer might very well be yes. Uh, now, you know, once you have institutions that are created, it's, it's hard to wind them down in any political climate. Um, but I think this is a healthy conversation to have in the US. I think it ought to be had pretty much everywhere um, and have that debate and have the discussion. Uh, to look at things like redundancy and efficiency. Um, and I was never uh, a regulator who was jealous of my bureaucracy um, and uh, was always more interested in making things uh, more efficient. Um, and uh, I think that's a good question to ask. Uh, and that's my view from the FCC perspective, and again, not necessarily for Ireland. But and what about his point about the sunset clause? Uh, Isn't that, uh, doesn't this area, because the future it may be Imminent. I mean, the future is always imminent, of course. That's it. But, but, Let's hope. But, but in this case, something may be out of date faster than in most yeah. other. Uh, so isn't, this, isn't the notion of a sunset clause, which can, of course, be, be reviewed right. and renewed if necessary, but also might just lapse? Yes, it's, I think it's, it's actually... It's a good idea. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. I'm sorry. I neglected. I got off and uh, took the scenic route to answer your question. Yes, I think it's an excellent idea, actually. So uh, since my time at the commission, I, I advocated for sunsetting uh, rules. Like you said, you can always reinstate them. 
um, but they should be refined. There are a lot of rules in the FCC's books. You know, we have the Code of Federal Regulations, and the FCC's portion uh, is, you know, grew from in 1961 to about, I want to say, just under 500 pages to almost 4,000 pages, right? And a lot of them were just left on the books. They weren't enforced anymore or whatever, but uh, they should be sunsetted and, and just gotten rid of, and if nobody notices, then maybe they didn't really uh, provide much of a benefit to begin with. If it is important, then it'll be renewed, or it'll be renewed in a modified uh, way. It, it, you know, from your very first question, isn't the marketplace moving so quickly? It absolutely is, and there are new challenges and new questions, a lot of which we're raising today, um, which could be addressed through uh, some sort of periodic review every seven years, 10 years, or whatever the case might be. And in general, um, what's your view of getting the balance between consolidation of the market and competition? Yeah, so interesting. So, uh, you know, economists. What's the optimum will, number of yeah, players, I, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, the, the market uh, tends to uh, try to sort that out itself. Um, if you have a perpetual race to the bottom on price, what does that do to investments? Uh, economists of different stripes can have debates over that. Um, and uh, but if you have too much consolidation. What does that do about just institutionalizing complacency among the incumbents? Uh, and therefore, you don't have any advancement uh, that way either. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, certainly any economists would say four is competitive. Uh, three, some would say, is also competitive. Um, still in the US, actually, we do have the big four wireless carriers, but the average US consumer still has a choice of five uh, consumer, the average consumer, not everywhere. Um, so that's certainly by anyone's definition competitive. I think you have to look at what is happening. Are prices going down and, and is innovation going up? If prices are going down and innovation is going up, that's a very good sign. Um, if and prices that's, go that's down, happening, isn't it? that's happening in the US yeah. anyway, certainly. Yeah, a lot of CapEx and experimentation. I mean, every day, you know, new devices, new services being offered, it's wonderful. Um, if prices go down and innovation starts to stall, that starts to tell you something. Uh, if prices go up and innovation stalls, that tells you even more. That's, that's bad news. Um, but again, in wireless, I think uh, unli the use of unlicensed actually tremendously helps the whole competitive equation. It's harder to measure if you're an economist, but I think it be provides a check and a balance and keeps everyone honest. That's why I've been a big proponent of like, unlicensed uses of the TV white spaces, for instance. Mm. You've, you've said there that the NSA revelations recently made things sticky and difficult, which is a euphemism, I suppose. Mm. Um, but if you, were, if you were batting for the, as, as you did so often, going into an international negotiation on behalf of the, uh, the, you were batting for the US State Department, were you, part of their team? Going into right, such the state takes the lead and we, we played backup you, singer. You, you, oh, played backup singer, okay. Yeah. So if you were going in, how, just how difficult would, would that be now? Uh, how, much, how damaging has all, has all that been in Europe? Uh, throughout the globe, it's been very damaging. So I, I'm actually, I, I, overall, I try to be an incurable optimist. But when it comes to the uh, ITU plenipotentiary next year, I'm, I'm quite pessimistic right now. Um, and the trajectory of where we're going with the sort of uh, Dubai being a, a big turning point, uh, then the NSA revelations fueling all of that at the worst possible time. Uh, as we head into next year, I think the trajectory is, is not good. I think uh, as um, the proponents of more ITU intervention in this space show, they've got the votes, uh, and they were willing to depart from a long-standing tradition at the ITU uh, of unanimous consensus. Uh, so that had been the hallmark of how the ITU did business, and um, we saw that end last December. Uh, when uh, it was roughly a 60-40 vote. Um, and uh, so that means they're willing to take, you know, ma majority, I mean, 60 percent's a, a lot, but uh, when you're departing from unanimity to settling for that, that means 40 percent of the countries uh, were not partaking or uh, uh, didn't vote uh, or won't vote uh, for those changes. So um, I'm, I'm rather pessimistic as to where that goes. Then you have the prospect of sort of a bifurcated uh, internet. These are treaties, and in our country, the treaty has to be uh, ratified by the U.S. Senate, uh, so it won't be. Um, and other countries, the same thing. If they're not signing on to it, you have some countries living under this and others not. That creates an engineering nightmare in terms of the internet of 
how do you have this balkanized you know, patchwork quilt uh, for internet governance or the economics of it and all the rest. And that starts to drive up costs and create uncertainty. So when you drive up costs in the internet economy, some things that are free will no longer be free. Uh, new, new innovations, are, they're impossible to measure uh, when they don't happen. So in other words, the unintended consequence of uh, a change in the regulatory construct, regardless of its domestic or international, um, it's impossible to measure what doesn't happen as a result. Uh, but there will be things that do not happen as a result, certainly in the developing world. And maybe that's a little easier to, to measure because we'll have it and they won't. So I'm pessimistic um, in the short run, you know, in the next five to 10 years, but you know, longer term, I'm more optimistic. And in general then, um, and given that, uh, the, I keep coming back to this point about the future being so, so difficult uh, to read. Uh, despite regulation, th th this whole uh, technology is itself anarchic. I mean, it is accessible by some people whose governments do not want them to have it. And we've seen that in the way the news has been, uh, the way the news broadcasting has been uh, influenced by iPhones and footage being shown and sometimes needing to be authenticated because it too can be, mm -hmm. can be propaganda mm -hmm. and, and e quite easily forged if you think about it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, or fabricated. What's your view of the impact of this technology on those who will ignore the regulation and will just have this unintended consequence of impacting on the way the world is and the, what will it do to sovereignty, what will it do to our authoritarian regimes over the next few years? Yeah, and so I've spoken and written on this very subject, and I think authoritarian regimes as a result are really in danger. Uh, so uh, that's the good news and from my perspective, unless you're a pro-authoritarian regime. Um, so uh, because the sovereignty of the individual is so empowered, it's easier to connect, um, and it's easier to, do, it's easier to work around government uh, uh, censorship as a result, as we see different types of networks being deployed and different ways of working around them. Um, the good news is, is that makes it easier to organize politically. You know, there is a downside to it, which I think it does fragment um, uh, society in a way, so we can become more tribal. Uh, so we were talking about at the lunch earlier about you know, political speech and uh, fairness doctrines and things of that nature. And uh, I think the, the plethora of choices you enjoy in the media marketplace now, thanks to the internet, uh, tends to show that people don't want to look at the opposing viewpoint or the viewpoint that makes them uncomfortable. They want to look at what makes them comfortable uh, for, on the whole, right? So you, you gravitate towards what you already think in a way. Um, is that good? Um, uh, and what does that do? But overall, I think uh, uh, in, in terms of having uh, capitalistic liberal democracies, um, uh, that these technologies will only help that. I think we'll see uh, decentralization of capital as a result as well, which is a good thing. So more ownership of property, be it uh, corporate property or, or just capital in general, real property, whatever the case might be. Um, I think these technologies will help all of that and it'll create a bit of a virtuous cycle. Now, having said all that, there are a lot of negatives that come, come around as we discussed at the beginning of the talk, uh, but that uh, come along with, uh, with the ease of access of information. Okay. Oh, we have another question. <clears throat> um, can I ask you, since those artifacts uh, go from government and they go back to the donor, my question is, um, you've mentioned this um, uh, student that could access the internet without being a subscriber or without being a student in subscription to the internet. You've also mentioned the fact that she not all profit from subscribers but on users. But that in fact raise the question of who should pay for the infrastructure that allows Excellent question. So, okay. excellent question. So, uh, I've long talked about the internet being open and free. Uh, I don't necessarily mean free in terms of it should be free to everyone. There's no cost. How do you support the build out of the infrastructure? Uh, when I say free, I mean freedom enhancing. Um, so, yes. I, so, unlicensed. Uh, in particular, does tend to mean free access, uh, but not always. Um, if you've ever been in an airport or an airplane trying to use Wi-Fi, you're at a hotel, you can pay dearly for that Wi-Fi. Um, 
but I, I do believe the market will sort that out if it becomes an uneconomical to offer, uh, let's say, free wireless. Uh, someone has to backhaul that, by the way, and that's going to be probably a piece of fiber at some point. And that costs money to dig up the streets to lay the fiber um, and operate it. Uh, so what, how do you capture that? Is it going to be a subscription or is it going to be advertising or something along those lines? Yeah, it's a good point.